Good evening to all our watchers in India. Good afternoon to those of who you're watching us from the UK and good morning or wherever you are. Hello and welcome to this very special event on strengthening India's financial sector. It is um, a topic very close to my heart. My name is Sana Marora. I'm the founder and chair of the National Indian Students and Alumni Union in the UK. I'm also an investment management consultant on the side. Um, and I am delighted to welcome a very, very, very special panel event and um, today and then some very special guests. Um, it is something new we're trying at Nisao today as well. We are partnering with Penguin India, who of course is one of well, India's largest uh, book publisher, but also a renowned name across the world to mark the international book launch of a very special book that has just been uh, released called The Banker Who Crushed His Diamonds. Uh, we have its author, Furguan Maharkan, who will talk to us more about this very special book today. But before I move on, let me introduce my panel lists to you. As I said, Furguan, he is an, a former investment banker turned financial journalist. Furguan, you're a senior correspondent with Deccan Herald, um, and you have just published this book uh, called The Banker Who Crushed His Diamonds, which you will talk to us about today. And, and everyone will see why we want to talk about this book today as well. So welcome, Furkan. Um, welcome, Mr. Mohandas Pai. Um, not that you need any introduction, but for those of who, um, but I think, you know, for formality, if nothing else, let me do a quick introduction. So Mr. Pai is the chairman of Manipal Global Education Services and RN Capital. He has also served as a chairman of the board of the Securities and Exchange Board in India and is now a board member of the National Stock Exchange there. Until mid-2011, uh, Mr. Pai was a member of the board at Infosys, who, of course, we have all have heard of, a, a tremendous Indian success story. Um, he was a CFO there for a number of years, and at CFO, he played a strategic role in transforming the company into what is one of the world's most respected and well-known software services companies. Um, so welcome, Mr. Pai, and thank, thank you, you, you for joining us. Um, another very, very special panelist we have with us, Sanjay Jha. Sanjay is an author, political commentator. Um, he is the executive director of Dale Carnegie in India and was formerly quite heavily involved on the buy side um, as well as on the sell side. Um, for instance, I think Sanjay in leading the launch of the joint venture for mutual fund company between um, ITC Limited and BAT PLC in London. So welcome, Sanjay. We are delighted to see you. We see you on our screens every day and are delighted to have you with us today. Okay, let's carry on. Um, Kavita Chako is a senior economist at Credit Ratings in India, a credit ratings agency. She has previously also been an economist with the National Commodity and Derivative Exchange in India. And Kavita can talk to us all about the credit flow in the economy, which, which of course is a crucial element of economic growth. Um, and so without further ado, let me just get started and let me talk about why we wanted to have this conversation today very quickly. Um, all of us have heard a lot about non-performing assets lately. We'll get to what they are and why they are important. We've heard about a lot of economic fugitives. We've heard about, you know, people, um, lots of banking frauds. Not that it doesn't happen everywhere in the world, but it has had a disproportionate time on our, um, or perhaps proportionate time on our news screens and our news prints um, in the recent past. We want to talk about what all of this is and why it matters. We also want to do that using um, pertinent examples from Furkan's book, um, a story of um, Yes Bank, which is the fourth, which has been the fourth largest price private bank in India. So, you know, we're talking thousands and thousands of crores of rupees um, and the rise and dramatic fall of, of the man who led it at, at the realm, uh, Rana Kapoor. <laughs> I will also, before we get started, very quickly make some housekeeping announcements. All views today that are expressed are that of personal to the to the commentators on this panel, and, and the NISAO does not take any liability from, from a uh, representational point of view. Um, this event is being live broadcast on multiple social media channels, including that of ours, and as well as our media partners, IBT India. Um, and I think a number of other social media platforms as well. Um, and finally, a big shout out to our partners, the King's College London India Society, who is one of our oldest affiliate societies, as well as Study IQ, um, and of course, Penguin India. So with all of that out of the way, let us get started. Um, Furkan, I would like to start with you. In a very sort of spot, short amount of time, Furkan, tell me why you have written this book. Well, this was a... Diamond. Well, this was a topic very close to my heart. I, I remember covering this story two years before this thing happened, the March 5 collapse of Yes Bank and the subsequent bailout. 
and the things were clear from almost at least a year that the money is not coming for years uh, years back and all this while there was dilly dallying both by the management and as well as the regulators on this front so in all this mealy we saw 60000 crore worth of investor wealth being wiped off in a year and there were 16 lakh retail investors who suffered now let me put it into perspective if these 16 lakh or 1.6 million retail investors we are talking about if they from form a geographical unit they would they would be 153rd most populous country in the world out of 1 uh, 235 countries and the amount of investor wealth that was wiped off in a year if we put it in a perspective it would be 144th largest economy in the world out uh, out of 235 countries so in a sense the collapse of such magnitude needs to be chronicled to increase the financial literacy in the country see rbi is doing its part partially on financial literacy fund front sebi is doing it partially but we need people common people like you and me and people who have access also so we need to chronicle it to increase the literacy and we have to put the book in the simplest form possible so that even the common man understands it so thanks for coming so i think what you're saying is that we've seen in the very recent part past with yes bank the the impact of th- tune to, to to the tune of a significant amount in you know impacting lakhs and lakhs of investors where do these investors stand today where is their money there are their sitting sell uh, the in the real loss in the range of uh, 75 to 98% on their holdings in fact uh, i was speaking to some of them they they have 60% of their portfolio for, which in fact was a wrong decision on their part 60% of their portfolio parked with yes bank so and is this a one off event or is there a systemic issue here that we need to be talking it's about it's a systemic a systemic issue We It's saw five the- financial institutions failing in past less than three years. Yes Bank, PMC Bank, and these are five major ones: PMC Bank, Island FS, and uh, we saw DHFL. Then we saw recently Lakshmi Vilas Bank. So let me take this now to Mr. Pai. Mr. Pai, I'd like to understand if you could lay down for us where what is the current challenge that is facing. us in in india from the point of view of this the the stability of the banking system and why are all these issues with numerous banks happening well indian banking has deeply structural issues due to public holding public sector dominates now in the decade of 2004 to 2010 there was a large investment boom the economy is doing well it grew very well and the investment to gdp ratio is very high and at the point of time the banking system was captured by cronies and uh, political leaders there's something called phone banking and all that lending for the creation of assets power plants steel plants etc by people who had no experience no capability to raise equity etc led to high growth in banking assets and it led to a crisis in this current decade 2010 to 2020 so i think you know by the time we had come to 2010 11 the writing was in the wall then raguram rajan did an asset quality <laughs> review system which exposed the banking and we suddenly had about 15 lakh crores of npa very high npa this was due to the public sector character of the banking system large lending to people who had no previous capacity to set up huge plants for example uh, the two brothers who set up bush and steel they got 80000 crores nobody asked them where is the 40000 crore equity that you must get in to start two huge steel plants nobody asked them the question and then because the asset review the banking system essentially shut up lending and the government had to recapitalize and the new this current government did not understand the gravity situation did not recapitalize earlier they did it in driplets till maybe the last two years and we had a crisis where the banks were not able to lend that led to declining uh, growth in the economy and when the economy stalls and does not grow at the same pace because of certain structural issues lack of liquidity the nps rise at the same time private sector banks like yes bank and possibly ilfs got caught here because of bad management trying to play god and trying to you know uh, fish in trouble waters and they did not have the capital uh, to lend i mean ilfs did not have the capital to build the kind of balance sheet and yes bank was not able to raise the capital and they grew very fast at a particular point of time especially when the bad loans uh, became known in the entire system 
So Indian banking suffers from structural challenges which they're getting over now. And that should be the public sector share should come down. The private sector should go up because the private sector can raise capital. There should be better risk uh, management capabilities within the banking system. You know that we don't have a good bond market. We have a bond market where people can raise money, but there's no trading in the bond market. And India is a country where the banking system uh, gives much more money than the bond market. The total lending in the banking system is only 50% of GDP. The total deposits are about 75% of GDP, uh, the latest data. And uh, we don't have a bond market and we are short of capital. So all that led to a banking crisis. We also had a crisis much earlier. I think they got over it by the time when we came to 2000. And now uh, we again, and it got over it and between 2000 and 2004, because interest rates came down because of certain government policies, they were able to have large profits on the investment portfolio. They could recapitalize and it started all over again in a, in a cyclic manner. Today, the good news is public sector lending has come to something like 60, 62%. Private sector lending is picking up. The private sector is properly capitalized. Large part of the public sector has been capitalized. Number of banks have been cut down. Some of the banks are going to get privatized. And uh, there is greater risk management by people in the financial sector. So hopefully, we see the lesser capitalized banks uh, have regulatory action to increase capital. And I think all the steps taken by the Reserve Bank of India in making sure the banks are better regulated are bearing fruits. But the banking system, even today, is suffering from uh, in inability to understand risk and to lend. Many of the public sector banks, which are 65% shares, are not lending. They're not lending. They're very scared. And uh, of course, growth is now coming back because last three, four years, growth came down. Growth is now coming back uh, because there's greater confidence after COVID. So hopefully in the future, we should be in a very different footing compared to the past. Thank you for that very wide ranging and extremely insightful, um, you know, setting the scene. You've said a lot of things and let me try and unpick them one by one, the, the key items there. But let me start with um, Sanjay. Sanjay, you've... Um, you've worked across the political, you worked across the, the commercial, the, the banking side. So you've got a great sense of, um, you know, the, the systems and the institutional side. Let me ask you from a from the point of view of both having been on this side of the industry as well as now from, from the point of view of a citizen, what is... What do you think is going on from the from say to a certain degree of an objective outside view? And what is the average person on the street making of all of this? Well, Salam, first and foremost, uh, big congratulations to Furkwan for a fascinating book. Uh, I confess not having read it yet fully, uh, but the fact that his book talks about a larger crisis of banking because banks are supposed to inspire trust. And if banks themselves fail, then I think you know there's a serious credibility challenge in India's financial system. So I think a great effort by him. I also need to make a full disclosure. Rana Kapoor uh, was my boss at Bank of America. So uh, my prejudice may be a little uh, far too luminous here. But you know I, I do believe that he is the tip of the iceberg. And while right now he's the flamboyant poster boy of everything that can have gone wrong with the banking sector, I think it is a manifestation of a larger, deeper malaise within the system. Uh, to answer your question in short, frankly, it was a troubled situation for a while. Uh, you know, there has been a twin balance sheet problem that I think uh, Mohan rightly alluded to. Uh, there was this, you know, India went through this yo-yo of an economic boom and then a the little bit of a slowdown. Uh, we all know that the great mortgage crisis happened in, in America. India bucked the trend. But at some point, you know, that excess liquidity in the system had to hit us. And therefore, you had a lot of projects, stalled projects, up to 20 lakh crores in India. So there were a large number of, you know, twin balance sheet problems, corporates with very bleeding balance sheets, banks that could not recover them. Now, what happened was that progressively, and in my opinion, this is a, a political statement I need to make, that even Mr. Modi's government underestimated the damage of the NPS to the banking system. I mean, they should have swung into action a lot earlier. Now, because of the fact that the economy did well for a while in post-demonetization and you know, very sloppy execution of GST, a great GST is a great act, by the way, but very ham-handed execution, it became a double whammy and, you know, frankly, the steam went out of the economy. Just when you thought that India could actually be, you know, pretty much on a, on a positive growth curve. 
I think all this resulted in what we call as the great economic slowdown. And that worsened or aggravated the real crisis for banks. Rana Kapoor's bank, Yes Bank, is a victim of the larger economic circumstance. And obviously, to a great extent, uh, extremely poor corporate governance, uh, poor due diligence, uh, you know, extremely uh, risk-prone lending. Uh, some of their biggest you know, assets or loans have gone to the Anil Ambani Group, uh, to SL, to Jet Airways, to Cafe Coffee Day. There are some, some big accounts that really swallowed a lot of the Yes Bank money. Or I think all of this worsened it. And Sanam, important to point out, because we're discussing the Indian financial system, that even the shadow banking system that both Futwan and Mohan mentioned, which included ILFS, DHFL, et cetera, I mean, they went bust, it aggravated the problem. Because many people who can't go to banks were going to shadow banks, uh, which let's call them NBFCs. And when they also, frankly speaking, uh, you know, defaulted, uh, their biggest lenders were again commercial banks. Uh, while you know Rana is in the in the thick of the storm, don't forget that ICICI has had serious issues. And uh, you know, frankly, if you dig deep into a lot of Indian banks' balance sheets, uh, you know, post COVID, you'll find the NPAs will be fairly disturbing. Uh, where do we go from here? That was your question. I do believe that where the investors or the depositors are concerned, you know, everywhere. Uh, people have to look at not just fanciful returns on their savings or fixed deposits or very high returns on, the, on their stock purchase, but they've got to look and evaluate end of day as to why is this particular bank or institution showing me the numbers they are. I'll give you one example. Between 2014 to 19, and Furkan, you can just kind of certify whether my numbers are right or wrong. Uh, Yes, banks' portfolio of loans increased from 55,000 crores in 2014 to 2,41,000 crores in 2019. In the same time, that's like a 35% CAGR. India's GDP may have grown by 6%. This one grew at six, six times the GDP. I mean, there is a definite uh, trend here that people should have been able to see. The other part, Sanam, that we cannot ignore is the role of the RBI. I agree that, uh, you know, uh, it's no doubt that Raghuram Rajan had great intentions, right? But he moved on at some point. And I think a lot of people in India tend to believe that the RBI is, you know, the mother of all institutions can't go wrong. Frankly, the question needs to be asked, why did the uh, RBI fail in terms of putting the prompt corrective action earlier on Yes Bank? Uh, why didn't, for example, the RBI catch the Nira Bodhi case earlier, right? So there has been a lot of regulatory oversight in India. And in my last simple point here would be that ultimately, whether we like it or not, you know, people in the markets play for greed. You know, I, I think when the markets crash, we all begin to talk about protecting the small investor, right? But don't forget, in a booming market, the small investor also makes a big killing. The small investor only becomes a very uh, somebody we need to cuddle like a chua because you know now you've got a broken heart when the market crashes. But I think people should know. Markets give you returns. Equity is the higher the risk, the higher the return. I don't deny that. But whether you should be over-invested in equity, that's a call they need to take. And within equity, what stocks do you buy, what sectors you are in are calls people need to take. So I do believe that you know there's a good campaign being done about mutual funds. Sahi hai. I would recommend to all investors, please buy mutual funds. You won't burn yourself down. I started Alliance Capital in India. I'm very proud of that. I started Zurich or the Threadneedle Fund. And I do believe retail investors should remain in mutual funds and let the big shocks like Mohan and Porkwan and Kavita play the stock markets. People like me are jackasses. We only sit outside and make comments on these Zoom shows. Yeah, apart from that, you just happen to launch mutual fund companies and whatnot. But <laughs> thank you for bringing that perspective in, Sanjay. Let me take this question to Kavita. Kavita, one of the things that um, Mr. Pai laid down was that there is not enough happening on the bond market in India. You know, we're very heavily equity invested. There's a major skew there. Can you, as someone who works in a credit research organization, as, as someone who covers the macro economy, talk to us about why that is the case? Why is there this... Um, great skew towards the equity side and not enough and and towards the banking sector whereas not enough liquidity comes from the bond markets which is what we see in in other developed nations for instance so the peculiarity of the indian bond market is that it is heavily skewed towards the government securities market 
Okay, so there's uh, not much uh, depth or uh, development which is happening in the corporate bond segment. And uh, for uh, uh, the uh, fund availability in the economy, you need to have depth and growth in the corporate debt market. Uh, as a percentage of GDP, the issuances there would be less than 3.5% of GDP. While we have uh, made great strides uh, when it comes to equity markets, the same has not happened uh, in case of corporate bond markets. Now, uh, the, a couple of reasons here, uh, one which I mentioned that uh, most of the securities which are being issued in the debt markets here are government securities. So they occupy a large chunk of uh, the share there. Okay, and even by, by nature of the companies which are issuing bonds, uh, it is restricted to the better, uh, highly rated companies. So there also you have limited number of companies which are coming into the bond market. Okay, and in terms of secondary market also, there is no depth and liquidity. The participation there is less. So as a result of which this uh, uh, debt market, corporate bond market has not really developed over the years. You know, in recent past, there are some measures to deepen this uh, market, which have been brought about by the regulators, but there has not been much success there. And uh, development of this bond market is crucial because uh, the long term fundraising should typically happen from the bond markets rather than from uh, the banks, because there is this asset liability mismatch which comes into the picture when you are raising funds from the banks, whereas uh, bonds are typically geared towards long term funding which unfortunately is not the case in India. Thank you for, for setting that out. We will come back to this because towards the end of this session, I'd like to come back to what the future is for India then on the whole from an economic and from a banking standpoint. So thanks, Kavita. But for Gwan, I'm going to come back to you. The one common theme across every um, thing we've heard and said, and I think it's a quote from your book as well, where you say that there are two types of models. There is the yes bank model and then there's the other model. And the yes bank model is the one where, um, you know, in a typical banking scenario, we'll, we'll um, evaluate the risk of an investment first and then issue the sales pitch. And in the yes bank model, it's the other way around. So, and that's what um, Sanjay mentioned. That's what Mr. Pai mentioned. There is this, you know, let's hone in on the corporate governance aspect now. What is it that went wrong? There were multiple red flags when it comes to, I mean, and it's something which is synonymous across the by banking failures or financial frauds that we have seen right from 1992. See, we have seen Harshad Mehta scam in 1992 and uh, Yes Bank scam in 2020. So in 30 years, RBI knew everything and RBI was laid back. So a lot of, lot of, there are a lot of questions that the regulator has to answer after all of this, and they need to get their game up. So, but but when it comes to governance, there were a lot of governance lapses right from the foundation of Yes Bank. See, the, at first place there was this uh, gentleman called Harkirat Singh. Harkirat Singh was ousted. Uh, the plan to start Yes Bank was between Harkirat Singh and uh, Ashok Kapoor, late Ashok Kapoor. So they got uh, Rana on board and then Rabo Bank on board. Suddenly, Rana conspired with uh, some officials in the Rabo Bank and got Harkirat out of the uh, venture. So the idea was Harkirat, and Harkirat was nowhere in the picture when bank started. Then again, when in 2015, there was a clear report in UBS, which you might have read, uh, that uh, that said 125% of Yes Bank's net worth was stuck in uh, stress assets. So it should have a, a given, a, it should have raised some alarm bells in the regulator. It did not, and even after that 2015 report, June, uh, June or it was July 2015, that this report came in. And the reckless lending by Yes Bank continued, and I would, to an extent, disagree with the with the with the fact that Rana Kapoor was at the receiving end of it. See, when it when you talk about his uh, lending to DHFL, DHFL was a clear cut case of uh, evergreening of loans. So there, at certain play, uh, at in certain areas, he played foul. When you evergreen a loan, you know you are doing something which is not acceptable. So you play foul and then, you know, you have a wrong assessment of factors and the power was over centralized. So now look at this, look at the scenario. Here is a promoter of a bank who is also CEO and MD and who has rights to elect the board members as well as the chairman of the board. So how can any employee just, you know, resist him? 
you know over centralization is a big problem in corporate india we need to we need lot of decent centralization to improve corporate governance and mr pai because he is part of excellence enablers also he would and he has been historically one of the people who has been in forefront of corporate governance he would be more talking about it yeah and and that that is indeed my next question mr bai is someone who is so intrinsically involved from an institutional perspective we are also obviously very close to the current government is enough now being done i don't think we can see more examples of failures i don't think you know there are any more red flags that can be run but so my question to you is a what is now being done to resolve these issues that we have now ascertained to exist and two is enough being done because it this cannot carry on and and you know i'm for guana touched on instances for instance where employees can't be whistle blowing because of because of this problem of centralization but at a structural level forget i'm not even talking the role of the rbi just now but from a from a corporate level are there uh, checks and balances that need to now be enforced either from the government or from within the industry to stop this happening again you know we need to do many things and i don't think we're doing enough first of all we got to fix the accounting you see banking is risk management you manage risk right asset liability liquidity etc and and create risk so you have to move your accounting to an expected loss model rather than a incurred loss model in expected expected loss model every quarter end you have to evaluate the assets on the balance sheet and see whether the assets should be carried at the co- carrying cost whether you know whatever is the value that they being carried is it the correct cost are you going to realize the asset that means you have to make a judgment and that's what global banks are forced to do so they recognize the problem very early and then they're going for recapitalization now we have a model of uh, providing for npa which was based on the 1991 nasiman committee report we are not moved to the expected loss model and if you don't do that you are going not going to be aware of the losses in the balance sheet you're not going to make judgments etc second you got to fix the board you know in the board today because of rbi norms a lot of the credit proposals go to the board now tell me in a board meeting you have some 25 30 credit proposals for 1000 crores 500 crores and the board is supposed to approve what can the board do the board has no expertise the board is not to make credit decisions but the board has to approve so it has to be done by the management there have to be proper reviews and the third there is no legal requirement to have a cfo in a bank now who is in charge of risk management you need a full time cfo like all global banks has you need a full time office of risk management you need to have the institutional framework there and the framework has to be done unless the institutional framework you will not be able to quantify the risk and evaluate the risk very much and then the inspection of the banks should move to provision of capital rather than detail norms now in india you will be very surprised the most valuable person in any bank today is the person who has read all the rbi circulars with rbi has issued exhaustive circulars for time it tell you how to lend where to lend and why not to lend and how to do this how to do this everything so you don't require any judgment you just follow the circulars and everything you are fine but you know this you have to manage the risk how do you assess the risk how do you assess the risk of a steel plant which is going to be set up for the next 5 years how do you know that how do you assess the risk of an entrepreneur who does not know anything how do you assess the risk of capacity requirements in an economy how do you assess the risk of a unqualified promoter coming and say hey i want to make a steel plant i want to put a power plant i want to spend 5000 crores 10000 crores etc and you know the banks never had a lear a, a engineer or a, a system whereby they appoint somebody to disperse money to uh, for creation of assets so they believed whatever value the entrepreneur would do because you know they said they given the money he'll pay it back over time see whenever you give a project loan project financing is very exclusive it is very sophisticated you have to make sure to appoint a consultant or somebody who is going to ensure that the value of the asset is proper there is no siphoning of money in many of those npas if you look at the top let's say 100 npas there will be 60 70% don't tell me that you know you could not manage this 100 loans why did you make this 100 loans what are the motive behind this 100 loans if you remove the 100 loans the balance of the loans the banking is normal you can you always have the risk and manage the top 100 loans has spoiled the entire banking system now how you set up all this you are still not you should circular after circular after circular but the circular doesn't mean anything unless you have a framework and the framework is important but the banks have learned a lesson that is good news but the banks have become over cautious look at hdfc bank aditya puri did not make a mistake he raised capital on time 
He did not go lend to all these people setting up steel plants because he was very clear he's a particular business. What are the compulsion for them? The government was compelling, phone calls were coming, give to this fellow, give to that fellow. And many of them, because the public sector, their appointments depend upon what the government does, they went along. And these are all done in the UPA one part of the government. All right. And the consequence was in the latter part of UPA two. And the consequence, Sanjay made a very nice point, and thus I agree with him fully. The NDA government in the first part of their rule, first five years, did not do enough to recapitalize the bank immediately. They did not understand, I think, the gravity of the situation, what had to be done. And that led to a slowdown because banks stopped lending. So there are many, many reasons, many, many things to do. They have to do that. They can't clamp down the system. In India, you know, sadly, something goes wrong, you ban it, you ban it, you ban it. You can't do that. You got to set up institutional requirements and you want to build expertise in the bank banking system. If you look at a private sector bank, you look at a public sector bank, the public sector bank cannot compensate people. They got pay scales. They can't hide the best talent and they can't have sophisticated, experienced people come over to manage banking. Can they hire a Sanjay Jha? Sanjay knows risk management. He understands business very well. Will they be able to pay him to hire him? They cannot pay. And they're 60% of banking. So you've got to set right all these things in, in to have a very vibrant banking system in this country. Lots to do. Let me take that to you, Sanjay. You know, lots, lots to do, lots to take there as well from that very elaborate, um, you know, scene setting that uh, Mr. Pai did. Now, let me focus in on two areas that I want you to come in on, Sanjay. One, he spoke about a risk management framework, the fact that banking is a risk-based um, activity on the whole, and we don't seem to have what would therefore be a fundamental construct as a risk management framework to operate by. Um, and and I, I just want you to respond on that and where you think who needs to take ownership, because you know all well and done, a lot needs to be done, but who is it specifically that needs to inculcate that and what is it that they need to be doing and at what what scale and pace and then the second thing I want you to come in on Sanjay because you also have this hat of talent management and, and executive leadership etc is is there enough talent in India and enough trained talent already in order to be able to both at the same time, to my mind, rectify the issues that are already inherent in the system, but also enable us to grow. Because one of the reasons we were so shielded from the, or relatively shielded from the global oil crisis was because we weren't part of the overall world economy to the <laughs> we should have been, right? And so if we want to grow, if we want fintech, as we know, to be one of our growth sectors, we need to have the capacity and the capability to be able to deal with it while also sorting the mess we already have. So come in on those points, please, Sanjay. Well, I think of the talent, I'll give you an example of a, of a friend of mine who actually did his MBA with me from XLRI Jamshedpur. Uh, he worked with Citibank. And I'm glad Mr. Modi's government made him the CEO of the Bank of Baroda. His name is uh, Jay Kumar. Uh, he's a very bright talent. And uh, I, I keep reading that Bank of Baroda is actually doing very well compared to the other PS, PSU banks. And, you know, ultimately, you know, what Mohan is saying and what Kupuan has said is so true that you, know, you cannot run banking when you have a bureaucratic cholesterol where decisions have to be taken at the board level. I mean, you know, you, what do you need? You need talent. Risk management is not about just looking at a balance sheet or, or the PNL. Risk management is an ability to look at a project, understand the industry trends, what are going to be the global externalities, how much have you budgeted for certain downsides? What are the upsides? You know, you know, you even have to, you know, in future, uh, perhaps anticipate a pandemic. What do you do? I mean, this is exactly what risk management is all about. In very simple terms, risk management is where you actually inflate your expenses and you are conservative on your revenue. So even if you are bullish on your projections, you kind of create a downside to it. On your expenses, if you believe you can invest so much in technology and people, you budget for more in the event that the market becomes a lot more expensive. Now, there are some fundamental rules to follow, but I'll tell you what happens. Typically, whenever you get listed as a company, Sanam, the problem is everybody is looking at the results quarter to quarter. One of the reasons why Mohan's company, Infosys, and a couple of others have stood out like outliers is because while they had quarter to quarter pressures, because you, you get evaluated brutally by the research analysts, the markets respond to you, you know, by giving you a signal. I think a lot of CEOs tend to look at their performance on a short-term basis. I think this is a fundamental factor why many businesses with good people and good visions have faltered. 
because we are setting our goals to a very short term quarter to quarter performance and i want to make a point here if you look at the insolvency and bankruptcy code sana it's a very good step i think mr modi a couple of things that mr modi's government did well in the first term i would say the ibc was a great initiative because that is the way by which you can actually sort out recoveries and ensure that you know bad debts are actually siphoned off and companies acquired those those bad debts of those companies the problem is urjit patel wrote recently in his autobiography that even there they were told go slow and again the whole legal process you know made it a very complex embroiled issue so this is the problem in india you start with a good objective and ultimately there is some quasi political and uh, definitely a legal interventions that suddenly slow down the entire process now this is well this is the way we are as we say this is india is like that only and we tend to live with these imperfections but i think we need to challenge this status quo i also believe that the the objective to start a bad bank is a good idea uh, the bad bank is a good idea because at some point you got to recapitalize your banks for sure but at the same time you know it is not a bad idea to have a structured special vehicle that will address these issues of the npas because at some point historically you have to clean you have to clean the npas and then tell the banks go and lend on these norms now the problem is that you know you need people you need lesser cumbersome processes uh, you you can't have this ridiculous situation where the rbi can review the private banks but cannot review the public sector banks to me that's bizarre absolutely bizarre it doesn't make any sense at all and i do think at the end of the day i think in india we do not need so many banks so i think you know if we believe that too big to fail is the syndrome we're going to live with i'm sorry that's not the way it works i mean barack obama bailed out the big fish on wall street but trust me that's one of the reasons why donald trump became the president was he said listen mr mr barack obama the great democrat was ultimately helping you know all those guys to buy their little islands and their private aircrafts so i think there are these issues we need to address and i think the indian government will do good by allowing you know private talent to come into public sector banks and one of the structures that i think mohan and phukwan will both be aware is to create a holding company which then takes care of all these banks bring in good talent let them take bold risks but there are certain regulations you don't fool around with and i do want to make this point at the end i worked with bankam i worked with anz grindleys i've had friends in city in in goldman sachs and in in morgan stanley the problem is that everywhere you need to know as to how do you regulate you know there is a bubble people are not seeing the bubble in indian stock markets today right raghunam rajan was um, you know almost kind of called as the bad guy the pessimist the cassandra when he forecasted the wall street crash in 2007 8 so the truth is we need to be realistic economics goes through cycle businesses go through the ups and downs is how robust you are to absorb the shocks and move it up and i think in india we are still very vulnerable as we stand thanks sanjay and speaking of the vulnerability for one let me bring you in at this point right you've studied this you've written a book on it you you know this inside out you've been you've been a banker you've done your investigative journalism on this what are the parallels between the 2008-9 subprime mortgage crisis because at the heart of it it was about bad loans and what are the parallels to what we are seeing in the npa sector uh, on on the mpas just now and how long until it all blows up if we don't take the action that all of you have outlined today well in my opinion npas is just a tip, tip of iceberg that we are seeing right now a lot of it has to do with if you go to the books of the banks there is around 30 lakh crore 30 trillion rupees that is being lent out as working capital and there is no account of how much of that money has been diverted to cap- capital expenditure and it is causing asset liability mismatch right now the money is flowing and everything is going good there is liquidity in the markets imagine a situation when liquidity starts drying up there would be a problem in the financial system though it might not be visible to the naked eye, naked eye but there would be a problem another aspect of it is the difference between 2008 9 subprime crisis and this thing the india's npa situation right now the kind of borrowers in you if you look at subprime crisis it was mostly a gamut of retail borrowers that 
brought down the us banking system and you know they they were bundling all those retail borrowers into one product and selling it as uh, bonds in the markets and right now if we look at india's financial uh, mess in the uh, banking balance sheets it's mostly because of the corporate side lending there have been there have been little little to none uh, delinquencies in the retail side when it comes to indian banking but mostly it happens and one thing that i would agree with both mr pai as well as sanjay is about this thing the private sector versus the uh, public sector right now we are seeing a, a private sector being answerable only to rbi while as you know if we look at the structure of the public sector it's answerable both to the uh, department of financial services which is uh, basically a department within the ministry of finance as well as rba so there are two different set of regulations applying to two different entities in the same sector which which have the same business so until and unless that thing is not corrected i don't think there will be lot of improvement on that front Thanks, Sultan. And, and you know that that brings me to a separate point I wanted to cover, which is around two sets of instructions, two sets of regulations, two, and broadly speaking, two worlds within India. You know, there is the India which works for the rich very well, and and dare I say, because of one after COVID, the rich are becoming richer. It's not just an Indian thing; it is a global thing. Um, Mr. I see Mr. Pai smiling. Maybe maybe he can come on that. And there is the but let me let me just finish, and then I'll bring you in, Mr. Pai. And then of course there is the um, you know on the on the SME front, on the on the sort of um, you know other end of the spectrum, which is the Bharat, if I if I may put it in that way. You know, my question, I guess, is. is is there enough being done both generally but also at, you know given covid has accelerated many other trends that were already happening across the world including in india from where we are just now unemployment is at a record high economic growth is not happening as we say you know we've been in negative trajectory uh, for quite a while and there is you know a lot of the liquidity that has been released into the markets globally but also in india has significantly gone into stabilizing the um you know the stock markets has it actually made its way to those who most need it whether it's people on the street or whether it's people um or whether it's the smes who frankly do need a lot more of that institutional support to come back up and 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 do well in the sme sector um or is it the case that the rich have been uh, you know gaining a ton of money lots of wealth and and i i won't name names but i know who we're talking about so so mr pai come in on that uh, please unmute yourself sir i have to be very careful when you make statement like rich have been getting something let's understand what happened in the crisis covid crisis all the central bank reduced interest rates government came in stimuluses and released 15 trillion dollars into the market huge surge of liquidity interest rates have come down and that creates an asset bubble and that leads to people investing more in the stock market stock prices rise now the stock market is rising is a consequence of the liquidity and government policy action that's point number 1 second because of covid and all this uh, lockdown the digital companies have seen a huge rise in the valuation if you look at the us today if you remove fangman rest of the companies are not seen a rise in the valuation and third in india too some companies seen in rise in valuation because of particular reasons now you can't blame the entrepreneurs and tell them the rich are becoming richer the poor are becoming poorer is not right it's a consequence of a market economy and huge amount of liquidity government release liquidity none of the so called rich people said hey release liquidity because most of these people you know in the united states the fang men didn't need government to do anything they have enough money even in india those valuations have gone up nobody have went and asked the government give me money they didn't so i think we got to be careful and you know because you know this this kind of attitude is actually hurting recovery second thing is india is in the midst of a v shaped recovery i think employment is coming back infrastructure spending is coming back we are one year from the date that uh, this took place so i think we are seeing a much better economic activity and we'll be very surprised so now you know we should talk again maybe one month from now this quarter is going to see a record tax collection record tax collection and much more than what has been budgeted so there is a recovery coming back is it adequate not adequate we need more public spending this happening and what government did also they had a 3 lakh crore guaranteed loan program for the msmes first time such a large amount it helped many of our startups got capital yes 
some of the banks made sure the startups pay back the bank loan out of the money, which is very, very wrong because they didn't give them liquidity. But I think a lot of things have been done. Now, is it enough? Is not enough. Uh, are the rich got richer? Yes, you are right technically, but the consequence of somebody's action, not because somebody did this. So I think, you know, in a capitalistic open market economy, these things are going to happen. You can't blame somebody. For example, if Sanjay was an entrepreneur and he was running one of those big companies and his stock price went up, will you accuse Sanjay of doing something wrong? I mean, he's a billionaire many times over, but you can't accuse him because, hey, he'll say, look, I didn't do it. What happened? Bezos' money went up. Bezos became richer. You know, our... Uh, you know, this guy from uh, Tesla became uh, richer. Elon must become richer. So what do you say? I mean, you say, you understand. So all I'm saying is, you know, we've got to be careful when you make this judgment because it creates a negative connotation. The last point I'll make is, last point I'll make it, we have to evaluate, see this, COVID has created the digital revolution. There's been a fundamental shift in the way people's consumer habits are there all around the world. And this is going to have a greater consequence on traditional companies greater innovation, higher mortality in countries. So all over the world, economies, you know, commentators like Sanjay and maybe Furkan Ju, who is a great writer, have to sit down, analyze and write the next great book, how this is going to impact the future and what needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Pai. No, and, 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 you know, I'm a big believer of capitalism, but I, I do also feel that the definition of capitalism needs a little bit of rework. And maybe we can bring I in agree. Mr. Amartya Sen at some point. And in a month, I we'll agree. have a follow-on conversation with Sanjay. Please come in. I had a short point to what uh, Mohan mentioned, that uh, while wealth accumulation that is, um, you know, kind of happens during a stock market boom is frankly notional because the markets can correct themselves and suddenly all those billionaires go off the list. But I think the larger point is that in the post-COVID world, especially uh, in countries like ours and, and all the emerging market economies that have had this, you know, economically skewed um, uh, historical baggage. I mean, uh, if you take any research and if India has around of 250 million people living below the poverty line, and I'm talking the extreme poverty definition of the World Bank, or if you talk about Oxfam reports that talk about 1% of Indians having over 60% of India's wealth. So there is a definite uh, disproportionate uh, you know, wealth distribution in India, cannot be denied. But I do remain uh, like you, Sanam, and like Mohan as well. I do believe that India needs a combination of both responsible capitalism, call it compassionate capitalism. Yeah. But yes, I mean, India needs a free market. You need private industry. You need growth. You need profits because they are the ones who can really create the jobs. They are the ones who can really make India truly grow, create the investment and really do the big IPOs. At the same time, you need the state to play a significant role because the informal sector may have been devastated which may not be captured in the official data because of the sheer you know, inertia in the way our structures are. By the time you, know, you get to know what's happened to the MSME or to the smaller entities, um, there is almost a time lag of one year. So the GDP very often does not capture how aggravated the situation is at the ground level. And that is where the bulk of India lives. So yes, there is a very strong argument to say that the state has to play a big role and therefore, I think all of us have been saying the same thing. This is a time to actually forget that, you know, big, uh, you know, that fiscal, uh, uh, you know, hat where we are, you know, talking about just a 3% fiscal uh, deficit. I think the states have to be a lot more aggressive in their expenditures, hopefully in capital investment more. But even if they are demand fueling by giving them, you know, direct benefits transfer or just give them checks by which they can spend, America is doing that as you saw in the latest uh, COVID fiscal stimulus bill, then I think these things will help. So you need investment from the private industry. At the same time, they will need a reason to invest and therefore you need demand. So I think it's a tough one for India. I will cut some slack to the government. I'm a supporter of the Congress party, but I'm not one of those you know, mad hatters who is rabid about it. I believe this is an extraordinary economic situation. Every government has struggled. I think we need to cut some slack to this government Give them, I think, this year to try and get the momentum back on track. And even if it's not a V-shaped recovery, I think what we need to factor in is that a lot of Indians will have now gone below the poverty line. And therefore, the state will have to play a very, very, I would say, you know, you know, sensitive role because you will not get the revenues, perhaps. And at the same time, you may have to commit on certain expenditures and health and education being very primary. So it's a tough one. You've got your, both your feet on a banana peel. But you got to know how to skate. 
that's that that's a brilliant point you've got both your feet on a banana peel but you need to know how to skate while while trying to deal with this inherent bureaucratic cholesterol that mr pai um spoke of but i will start taking closing comments soon before i do that kavita i want you to bring in on one specific question sanjay of course referred to the role of the private sector the private sector also needs to invest the government has done some um you know some some release of liquidity into the markets i guess two two questions kavita one is is there an element of crowding out because you know there is a lot of government sector borrowing there's a lot of uh, borrowing from the public sector from the private market from pri- uh, from from the markets what is that doing to the private sector well uh, the high government borrowings which is envisaged for this year both at the central level as well as the state level for fy22 okay would lead to a tightening of the liquidity in the system and uh, this would leave less funds for the private sector and retail borrowers as the economy is beginning to recover it also raises the overall cost of funds when the increase in the supply of government securities is not met with adequate demand okay and this results in a rise in yields of these government securities and uh, you need to keep in mind these government securities serve as a reference rate for borrowing costs now all of this in turn has implications uh, for the economy as the availability of adequate and affordable funds is cr- crucial to private investments and thereby for sustaining economic growth another thing is that we are currently faced with a situation of low demand for government securities amid the increased supply of these and this has pushed up yields at the cost of and the cost of borrowing for the government now to add to this the prevailing and uh, evolving global market conditions too have been pressurizing yields and this poses a challenge for both credit costs as well as credit offtake and uh, economic growth hinges uh, to a large extent on credit growth so that is an area of uh, concern and we need to see what is the kind of action that the rbi will uh, take uh, to main anchor yields as well as to boost the credit offtake thanks kavita now i i know we're close to time so let me just start by taking closing comments my fi- my simple question to all of you really is where do we go from here you know um so and let me start with um you furkan you've written this book you've written it with the desire f- that the average person on the street takes more responsibility and and ownership you've written it with the desire of calling out all these systemic weaknesses but what is the message you want people to walk away with and where do you think we'll go from here see we have been talking a lot about uh, the financial frauds the people are escaping from out of india and in fact just a small trivia here you be out of london mr rana kapoor was be he what rbi guys were telling at that point of time some of the my sources in rbi in january of 2022 months before yes bank's collapse mr rana kapoor according to my sources in rbi had escaped to london in fact he was in london but mr kapoor's explanation at that point of time was that he had gone to see his granddaughter now it's subject to conjecture but then london the we have seen nira modi escaping to london and then vijay malia so that said but then you know rana kapoor was not the first banker who erred and he won't be the last banker who has erred there would be people who would try to exploit the flaws in the system there are flaws in the in, and there are flaws in every system we saw bernie madoff scamming of people for 25 billion dollars with sec around and this is this is not and 25 billion dollars is almost three times the amount that were got wiped off due to rana kapoor's actions or rbi's inactions at yes bank but what we need to think we have a regulator in the form of rbi so rbi as a joke at times rbi should rename itself as reactive bank of india they only react it has to be more proactive being a regulator it has to be proactive in taking actions i mean the thing in in case of yes bank was visible since 5 years or in other cases i mean in lakshmi vilas bank which is very close to where i live i mean it is based out of chennai and i am in bangalore right now so lakshmi vilas bank the things got messy right from 2017 onwards and it was placed in prompt corrective action for a year in 2019 
And, you know, there have been delaying tactics. RBI should rather not focus on those delaying tactics. If there is a problem somewhere, address it quickly. Move ahead, move to address it quickly. And the second thing, you know, somewhere I feel, and going back to that debate, capitalism versus uh, socialism, it takes me back to that. I mean, I'm a firm believer of uh, capitalism. And the fact remains, there is no concept of bailout since uh, capitalism. Bailouts is, if anything, but socialism for uber rich. I mean, that is 0.0001% rich. So the bailouts is nothing. You're paying SBA, well, in, in this case, SBA is paying out for uh, systemic st stability, as we call it. And systemic instability was caused by actions of a private banker. And SBA is a quasi government organization. Why should it have been paying the for the, for, uh, the actions of a private banker? Now that said, RBI should, I mean, you know, it's easy way out to bail out a bank completely, but rather RBI should focus on saving the depositors interest. I know depositors are paramount in Indian setup. It's a politically, politically sensitive class of people who no government can afford to upset, but make depositors immune and let the bankers fail. And there, there has to be a particular regulation that has to come. If we have seen both Lakshmi Vilas Bank and Yes Bank, the aerial promoters just before the collapse of the bank, they sold off their promoter shareholdings. And who were left in lurch? They, it, was, it was the retail shareholders. So probably at some point of time when the bank's condition goes or any financial entity's condition goes below certain parameters of RBI, the promoters can't sell their stake. That should be the regulation. I mean, promoters have erred and let them suffer then. Promoters have heard let suffer. I might just say that, you know, where I live in London, not very far, a very short drive away from me lives one of the gentlemen you've mentioned as an economic fugitive in this rather large mansion. I do hope something is done about that very soon. Um, but on behalf of all NRIs, let me also say most of us are pretty hardworking, pretty patriotic <laughs> and have our hearts and heads in the right place. <laughs> Speaking of London, Mr. Pai, let me ask you to come in then, you know. Where do we grow from here? I know you've said in a month from now, there'll be a lot of large, you know, tax receipts. Where where do you see, what do you see as the future of banking? And where do you see us, um, you know, when are we going to come back to the 6 7% that is really, you know, of growth that, that, that to my mind is fundamental. That's the fundamental growth rate of the Indian economy. When are we going to come back to that? Okay, let me let me say the big, the big points, what we need to do on that thing. First, we need more capital to come into India. We are starved of capital. We don't have enough capital to grow at 7 to 8%. We need much more investment in infrastructure. We need much more investment in many aspects of the economy. We need more capital to come in. And the way I would suggest is government should look at borrowing $500 billion in overseas money, 25, 30 year loans, and bring in long term money at a time when the world is avanced with liquidity, interest rates are less. Yes, this all be in foreign currency, and we should learn how to manage that. It could add to India's reserves. But we should learn how to manage that. Those are the more money in the economy. Second, very importantly, we must, we must make sure that judicial reforms. Now, if you go bankrupt, if it takes four years to get a decision how to realize the assets, what can the banks do? The banks have lost all the money. Look at the Bush and Steel case, which is before the, before the you know, bankruptcy courts. It's going on and on for the last three and a half years. You need to have a legal system which will fix it within one year. And we need to build judicial capacity. These are big ticket things. The third important thing is the government should not interfere in the public sector banks. The public sector banks should be kept away from yeah. the government interference, like Sanjay said, by maybe a holding company structure. And they should be empowered like the private sector banks to compete, to pay good compensation and not be subject to CBC, CBI and all kind of government uh, because they're all commercial enterprises. They're all commercial enterprises. The fundamental problem is, I think in the 1950s, the Supreme Court decision in State Trading Corporation versus Union of India, where the Supreme Court held that the public sector is also called state. It's state. Because the public government owns a majority, it is called state. All rules applying to government employees will apply ipso facto. So we need to get away from that by a conflict amendment to make sure bank, all commercial enterprises, which are banks, are run as commercial enterprises. And the next thing which has to do is RBI has to remake its regulations to make sure they focus on risk management, on risk assessment of the banks, and look at capital and capital adequacy as a measure of looking at banks, bring in new accounting measures to make sure that early identification is everywhere there. They have to upgrade. And the last point, build up 
human capital capacity. There's enough talent. There are lots of people with good talent. Look at the foreign banks. They've got so many Indians. You know, I don't think India is short of talent. But unless you pay well, you will not get the talent in. If you're able to do all these things in sequence, in five years, you'll do well. And let me tell you, before I sign off, this year, everybody says we're going to grow 11 and a half, 12 percent in real terms, 15 percent, 14, 15 percent nominal terms. Of course, it's compared to the last year. So we should be able to grow. And I think, you know, we'll talk again after one year. We should be able to go on a steady 5 to 7 percent growth rate if the benefit of all the reforms done earlier come through and the global economy recovers a bit because we're impacted by the global economy. And I'm very optimistic because I live in Bangalore, Sanjay. Bangalore is the home of optimism, the home of startups. We see growth. We see money coming in. If you live in Delhi, you'll be extremely depressed. And you know, you know what is happening in the place. So as a very proud Delhiite, I will take, I will not accept that last comment. <laughs> Jokes aside, I mean, we're having good stuff happening in Delhi. We're having good investment in education and in healthcare. Um, but yes, you know, our, our uh, pollution needs to end for sure. Now, taking the final comment back to um, Sanjay then. Sanjay, where do we go from here? What, what do you think? You know, Mr. Pai has laid out these five um, sequential reforms that do need to take place in order to hopefully in a year back, um, very optimistically, get us back to that fundamental growth rate that, that India is very capable of. But where do you think are the chinks in the armor? What, what is going to stop us from getting there? And, and, and what are your closing thoughts, Sanjay? Uh, Salam, I'm sure all these uh, unintended uh, digs at Delhi and London uh, you know, have only provided a lovely uh, diversion to this uh, very serious discussion. And I don't believe that everybody who lands in London is necessarily an absconding fugitive. But why London? I guess strawberries and cream, you are to blame. Fish and chips, you are to blame. Uh, but, you know, I do, you know, frankly, uh, Mohan and, and Furkan have already highlighted what are the things that can be done. I am of the opinion that, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to repeat what Mohan and Furkan have said. There is absolutely no debate on that. I would like India to become a lot more, shall we say, dreaming big as a country when it comes to your banking system. You know, I remember I worked with bank amid sector and, you know, it, it was astonishing that the biggest banks at all times were Chinese banks. And we all know why Chinese banks had the highest valuations because, you know, they, they were just so heavily invested and, you know, they had these, uh, you know, they purchased some of these big companies all over the world. And I think in India, we are still taking baby steps. Like, for example, there has been this recent debate on whether corporates can invest in new banks. And there are a lot of people, including Raghuram Rajan, whom I deeply admire, actually, who has taken a more conservative view, saying that don't allow large industry houses to start banks because they will fund themselves. And again, yeah. depositors and investors will be taken for a ride. I'm not so cynical. Despite Nirav Modi, despite, you know, a couple of swindlers in the system, despite maybe Chanda Kocher, you know, kind of not doing great for the brand of uh, private banking or Rana, you know, making a mess of his uh, personal reputation. I do believe India has a lot of good people who, if they start banks, they will do a wonderful job. And, you know, end of day, it's all about giving, uh, having good regulation, uh, bringing in transparency, making disclosures mandatory. You can actually put in very strong guidelines to ensure that they don't fund their own groups. Why can't India have banks that are homegrown, that are that are able to meet the credit needs of India. If you look at the numbers, we are not able to meet the credit needs of our own country, whether it's big business, whether it's MSME, or whether it's small uh, borrowers. So I think there is a need to revolutionize Indian banking. And I would totally agree with this. I've been part of the political ecosystem. Politicians, please lay off. You know, we can't have politicians, whether it's BJP, Congress, or any damn party, sitting uh, in Delhi and, you know, that's what Mohan meant when he said Delhi, sitting in Delhi and making a phone call, this fellow has given me some donations to my political party, so let us be magnanimous in bailing him out somewhere. I'm sorry, this crap has to end. And the only way it will end is when we have discussions like this that are followed up and everyone, including the media and everyone talks about issues that need to be debated. And I'm very bullish that if you allow India, Indian talent to find its feet, there will be hiccups, there will be problems. This is, this is human, okay? I mean, America has people who are trying to beat the system day in and day out. I know for a fact that Citibank literally employs people to read the RBI regulation and say, hey, 
where is the little lacune and they will come up with this new product and by the time the government wakes up tons of money has happened so i'm sorry if city bank doesn't like me too bad but that's the way many of the foreign banks operate so i think we need to understand greed hunger for profits hunger for market share well that's the animal spirits of the private sector but if you have good regulations and people do follow corporate governance even that will be minimized there will be sporadic hiccups that's human but i think we will not allow the kind of collapses that happened in 2008 or earlier i think those will definitely come to an end thank you sanjay and and thank you to all our panelists we've had we've had a very wide ranging discussion today i feel i certainly feel a lot more enlightened and and i feel that you know we are very bullish on the indian economy we are very bullish on the banking sector we know we know steps have been taken we know that there is a lot more that needs to be done at an individual at a regulatory at a and at a sort of corporate level um so on that note uh on the and the positive note of being bullish but with you know a long road ahead of us i will call it a day and thank you so much to again all our panelists to purgwan congratulations again on what is today your international launch um so banker who so crushed the diamonds um you know it I, it's it is out now and and i think everyone if we will post the amazon link uh, to 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 purchase your book for gan and so thank you very much to all the panelists thanks kavita for bringing in that very sort of credit focused view into um and from a ratings perspective to this discussion and thanks mr pai and and, and mr jha for also bringing in this very wide ranging view of where the issues are what the challenges are and how we can sequentially address them going forward and and what it is that we need to um to to move forward so thank you again and thanks again to all our partners to penguin india of course for facilitating this conversation and of course to study iq and the kings college london su india society for being our outreach partners and and to ibt times for being our media partners i shall call it a day thank you very much and i'll take you guys up on the conscious capitalism discussion sometime soon <laughs> thank you so much for being a great host and for kwan once again all the best for the book thank yeah, all the so best for kwan and thank good, good work sana good work thank you everyone yes. thank, thank you, you. thank you thank you kavita thanks sanjay bye 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 bye